this webinar, Drought Impacts on Disadvantaged Communities Mitigation Strategies. I'm Katie Mauman. I'm the Water Initiative Coordinator for the Public Health Alliance for Southern California. We've got a really great agenda lined up for today. Um, but just before we get started, I want to take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. We're going to be recording today's webinar. And I wanted to let you know that we'll post the recording as well as the presentation slides and other resource materials that are connected to the presentation on our website. Uh, and please feel free to share this link with your colleagues who are unable to join today. Everyone has joined the webinar in listen-only mode, which means that your audio lines are muted for the time being. And um, we have options for you to enter questions in. You can type questions for the panelists anytime in this question box, which is on your control panel. Um, so those can be typed in any time. We will likely hold them to the end, but we'll also invite our panelists to address questions during their presentation if they choose. At the end, you can also ask a question or comment verbally by raising your hand on the control panel. Um, it's always nice to hear everybody's voices, and we really encourage you to be brave and speak up. Um, we've got a great group of health department leaders on the phone today, and this is a real opportunity for us to share with each other um, to hear from you as well. Um, so if at any time you experience technical difficulties, feel free to send a question to one of our staff or you can contact GoTo at this number. Um, and the raise hand um, feature again is here, uh, just to the left of your, um, of your control panel. So we'll see your hands and we'll, we'll call on you as we're able. So uh, just before we dig in here, I wanted to launch a couple of quick polls to get a sense of who's on the call and share that with you. So our first poll, uh, we're just going to launch now. And this is asking in what sector do you work or what, what, what group do you represent? So if you could take a, a moment and select one of these five options, that would be great. We'll just give it a few more seconds. Great. And then we'll go ahead and close that poll and uh, see what we've got here. So it looks like we've got a, a pretty even spread here between health officers and directors, uh, their senior management and staff and then some uh, government, you know, non-public health government, and non-governmental organizations and others as well. So it's a nice balance. Um, and then we'll go ahead and do a quick second poll just to get a sense of where in the state um, people are coming from today. So this is um, a request to just indicate which area you are calling in from, and we'll get to see uh, a little bit about who's on the call geographically as well. And again, a couple more seconds. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close this poll. And we see that we've got uh, half of the people on the call from Southern California, 25% uh, from Northern California, and uh, quite a number from the Central Coast as well, a few from the Central Valley. So that just gives you uh, and our speakers a sense of who's on the call today. Um, and so I'd just like to make a couple of introductions. Uh, on our call here at the helm, we also have Holly Calhoun, who's our food systems working group coordinator. Uh, and so thanks to Holly for, for holding court here on the back end, uh, as well as Tracy Delaney, our executive director of the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. Uh, so I'd just like to introduce Cheryl Barrett, who is the co-chair of our leadership council at the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. Uh, Cheryl is the Policy, Planning, and Prevention Bureau Manager for the Long Beach Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and she's been a great uh, visionary and lead in, in the Alliance work. And Cheryl's here to introduce our Alliance um, and today's speaker. So with that, I will hand the controls over to Cheryl. Welcome, Cheryl. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. And, and good afternoon, everyone. And this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to discuss a very timely issue. So on behalf of the Public Health Alliance of Southern California and my co-chair, Susan Harrington, the Director of the Department of Public Health at Riverside, we want to thank you for joining us in this very timely and important conversation today. 
The Public Health Alliance of Southern California, we are comprised of the local health jurisdictions in Southern California, and together we represent 57% of California's uh, total population, and we're deeply committed to our vision of making sure that our communities are healthy, vibrant, and sustainable places to live, work, and play. And um, I think our work around the water series is really a testament of the great work that we're trying to do to accomplish that vision. This is the first webinar in our health leadership series and specifically addressing public health directors, health officers, and other health department leaders. We are tackling questions facing health department leadership as we respond to the changing water conditions and policy in our state, our nation, and really all over the world. Today we're focusing on disadvantaged communities. However, equity is a theme that we would like to also be thinking about as we weave it through our entire series and our conversation today. For more information about our series, uh, please check out our Alliance website. You can also find all the webinars in our series and other materials in that um, website. So I get to have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speakers today, wonderful people that will be able to share with us their knowledge and expertise in um, drought issues and in water policy. Dr. J.R. DeShazo is the director of the Luskin Center for Innovation at the University of California in LA. He's also the professor and vice chair of the Department of Public Policy in the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA, where he is an expert in economics, public finance, and organizational governance. He holds a PhD in urban planning from Harvard University and a Master of Science in Economics from Oxford University where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He was the director of the Ralph and Gold Goldie Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies at UCLA for five years. He was also awarded the Professor of the Year Master's Program in Public Policy at UCLA in 2001, 2005, and 2007. We are happy to have you today with us, JR and looking forward to sharing your thoughts with us today. Another great uh, panelist that we have today is Jennifer Clary. Jennifer has served as a water policy and legislative analyst for the Clean Water Action since 2003. She has been a strong and tireless advocate for disadvantaged communities for many years. Jennifer directs the Central Valley Program and serves on key state, um, state stakeholder communities committees advising agencies on actions to improve groundwater quality and allocate funding for water infrastructure. She holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from UC Berkeley and um, we are delighted to have both of you here and help us provide a, a well-informed launching pad for our continuing conversation around our water and conservation and, and climate change as well. So with that, I will go ahead and yield the floor to uh, to JR, Dr. Deshaso. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with Jennifer and, and all of you. Um, what I'd like to do today is uh, talk about uh, the drought and the likely legislative action that it's going to create um, over the next several months to a couple of years, and, and how um, public health agencies at a variety of local levels of government can begin to identify the main issues that are going to be important for their communities in this broader discussion. Uh, and, and the real focus is going to be on how do we understand at the county level um, the water supply threats and vulnerabilities that face um, different communities within our service territories, within our jurisdiction. And what I'd like to do is, is uh, take um, as an example some of the lessons that we're beginning to learn from looking at Los Angeles County uh, and, and think about how we might scale those lessons uh, to, 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 and apply them and develop um, a, a, a basically an assessment framework, a needs assessment framework in other jurisdictions, other counties around the state. So um, the motivation is really how do we begin to understand the threats and vulnerabilities facing the community water systems in your service territory. And I'm going to focus on a variety of characteristics of 
community water systems as indicators of, of the different needs that they might have and the different threats and vulnerabilities that they may face um, in, the in the extended drought, but, but even in non-drought environments, many of these systems face very important health challenges and, and really in many ways uh, fail to provide basic, um, safe, a healthy service to their, to their households. Um, and so one of the characteristics that uh, is focused on uh, ritually in this, in this area is the size of the water system. And that's because small and very small community water systems uh, typically have very low managerial, technical, and financial capabilities, which can translate into uh, the inability to manage the quality of water and the quantity of water needs as they vary over time. Um, a second characteristic of, of these uh, communities served by these systems is going to be whether they're um, technically disadvantaged or a low income households. And for those that aren't familiar with this area, this has become a somewhat confusing area because this, the, the um, Cal Enviro screen, which is used by the California EPA, um, has one definition for disadvantaged communities. The water management community and regulatory community uses a different definition of disadvantaged communities. Um, and, and then there are other definitions out there that we'll want to talk about in terms of access to lifeline rates and things like that. And so I think one of the things the public health leadership needs to be aware of is these kind of what is represented by these different definitions of disadvantaged community. And we'll come back to that. Um, Next, uh, the third is really how vulnerable these, these um, different community systems are um, in terms of their water supply, where it comes from. And in particular, uh, there's a, a, tr a focus on groundwater uh, because that's being depleted rapidly because of the drought. Um, and so communities that rely 100% on groundwater face um, higher cost, higher pumping cost, as well as potential shortages. Um, but in rural areas and in middle-sized cities, um, we often find groundwater a concern because it's contaminated. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the context of the Los Angeles um, scenario. But the, the, the short version of the story is groundwater contamination plays a different ro role and it shows up differently in rural community water systems than it does in urban systems. And I'll come back to that. Um, the, the fourth characterization or characteristic that I think we need to look at when we're trying to understand our community water system populations is, is how vulnerable um, the communities served by different systems are. And as a shorthand for that, I'm going to look at the percentage of the population that's very young or very old uh, as an indicator of vulnerability to poor water quality and water shortages. And then the last area is just to understand the history of reported drinking water quality problems of systems within your communities. So these are, these are in a sense, going to be indicators. Um, let me also just anticipate one of the issues that's going to come up is uh, much, of our, much of our focus is on community water systems, but there are a variety of households and, and communities that aren't officially part of any of these community water systems. They're on, on very, um, they're on wells typically, uh, or hauled water, um, and we'll come back to that issue. Um, they're, they're relatively, in the big pictures, small, well, small as a percentage of total users, but still upwards of two million households or, um, uh, or two million people um, in this category. So we'll come back to them and talk about some of the challenges at the, the county level that we face. Um, why, why do we want to understand um, the different threats and vulnerabilities uh, that, our, our, that our community water systems face? Well, there's, there's a conversation, a series of conversations emerging about how to improve and reform and create new policies that support community water systems, which are really the building blocks for the entire drinking water supply system at the state level. And those policy debates revolve around um, who sh who's entitled to emergency assistance um, and understanding who users of those assistance are sort of who, who the chronic users are. Um, 
there are separate policies that are designed to improve um, poor drinking water quality within systems. This is technical assistance. Um, there's a third set of policies designed to encourage the consolidation of systems so that very small systems or small systems might be absorbed into larger systems with which may have um, more developed uh, technical capacity and the ability to provide more reliable water and water of a higher quality. Um, and, and then there, there is kind of a, a scattering of, of, of policies and programs that that need to better target technical and financial assistance to community water systems. And on top of all of these policies, uh, you know, of, of which you may be aware, there is also, um, just building off of this technical assistance idea, quite a bit of money, quite a bit of resources that should be available for community si systems in your service territories uh, that would come from Prop 1 funding. And the State Water Quality Control Board is now trying to decide uh, what the process is going to be for dispersing these funds to provide technical assistance. And so that the headline here really is how, how can you, uh, as a leader in the public health arena, begin to understand the, the threats and vulnerabilities facing different um, Sub, basically different groups of community water systems within your, your jurisdiction and represent their interest and their needs and engage them and make sure that they receive the benefits of some of these state policies. And, and as those state policies evolve, be, being prepared to represent the interest and needs of, of your, um, your, your, your community systems in that conversation. So, you know, a big part of where we're starting, and I'm starting in this analysis, is, is the realization that most of us don't understand uh, the community water systems that are in our counties. Uh, and so, for example, I have yet to meet anyone who guessed how many community water systems there are in Los Angeles. Uh, many people guess, might guess 40 or 50 or 80, but there are over 228 community water systems in the county of Los Angeles today. And they are very, very diverse. And um, I want to start off by uh, focusing on this characteristic of size as an indicator of who might be most vulnerable in terms of the managerial capacity uh, that the, that's embedded in these, in, in these systems um, and, and beginning to identify some of the vulnerabilities associated with, with small and very small systems. So the, the, the real question is how many and where are these small and very small systems within a county? And, and this is a question I think you'd want to ask of your own um, jurisdiction. So in, in Los Angeles County, what we, what we might notice kind of right away is there are over 100 um, small and very small community water systems uh, in, the, in the county. That's 100 out of approximately 100 out of 228. And if you look at um, the types of governance that uh, is represented by these in these these small systems, you know what we tend to see is that most of them in the the very small category are provided by private water companies, which means they're regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission. And then um, in in both the small and very small, uh, there's also a significant um, percent that are mutual water companies, which are essentially these, it's almost a nonprofit um, type um, governance structure. Um, and we, we want to focus on governance structures because some of the reforms that are needed and issues around consolidation are going to turn, you know, the, the, the way that we would bring about change is going to depend on the type of governance structure that's there. Um, the, let's see here. Um, I think I've just, uh, okay. Um, the other thing that it's, it's worth noting, and, and, you know, Los Angeles is a very obviously urban uh, county. Many of these small and very small systems, while some of them are embedded in the suburban fabric of the city uh, and the metropolitan area, many of them are on the periphery. They're on the margins, and they've, they have, um, they have sort of agglomerated in the 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 the, the, um, the outer areas, making them geographically isolated, which sometimes raises its own challenges in terms of 
regulation. So how many of these rely on groundwater? Uh, what, we, what we see is that the smaller the systems, the more the groundwater reliance. Um, it's it's easy to, easier to create these systems when you can drill a well and then connect your households to the well than it is to connect to you know, regional distribution lines. Um, that's important because it helps us understand which systems are likely to or are vulnerable to shortfalls as groundwater levels fall, um, higher cost as groundwater pumping costs increase with falling groundwater, and also potentially contamination. Um, so this is a little bit redundant to the previous slide. You could just see that um, groundwater dependence is a pretty much a, a defining characteristic of the uh, the systems here in LA County. Um, now, what's interesting is when we turn to the question of contamination, we really don't see that many systems that are small to very small facing contamination problems. It's it's roughly 10 to 12 percent. Um, it turns out that some of the larger sized community water systems actually have many more um, wells that are contaminated. And one of the reasons for this pattern is that in these urban counties, um, very frequently you get industrial development in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And, and in, these, in these suburban areas, which um, produces groundwater contamination. And the contamination in these, in these areas, at least, tends not to be the traditional nitrate contamination or arsenic contamination that you would see um, in, in very rural areas, it tends to be more legacy industrial pollution. Um, okay, and then a, a very important thing that, and, and let me just say that the, the analysis I'm presenting for LA County is all based on publicly available data. And so none of this data that I'm presenting now um, is was collected by surveys or is proprietary. Um, we could develop uh, similar kinds of analysis, you could develop similar kinds of analysis using the data that's available for your county. And this is also true of this next map, which really explores how climate change over the next uh, 75 years is going to impact different community water systems differently. And, and this is the, the, the result of downscaling of climate models that was done by an um, atmospheric scientist named Alex Hall and his group here at UCLA. We have this downscaling for all of Southern California, and by the end of the summer, we'll have it available for publicly available for all of California. And, and what this allows us to do is to look forward over the next 30 to 75 years and anticipate where water consumption is likely to increase because of the number of increased extreme heat days. That's going to be heat days, I think, over 95 degrees. And, and to begin to, to plan at a county level to support these, these systems in these jurisdictions, maybe targeting them for improved technical assistance, maybe targeting some of them for consolidation, um, so that they're in a more robust managerial posture as they experience um, higher average temperatures and an increase in the number of extreme heat days. And then there, there are the more traditional questions that many of us think of right away, which is which systems have the most vulnerable populations. And so what one of the interesting things that I'm going to show you is that um, what we in LA County would call our gateway cities, which are these, this, it's sort of this lower necklace of, um, of cities uh, in, this, in this area. Um, it tends to represent uh, our immigrant population and, and have a high concentration of, of, of recent immigrants. Also has the highest percentages of, of the, the very young and the elderly. Uh, some of these community systems have um, anywhere between a quarter and almost a hundred, you know, upwards of 75 percent of the population either very young or elderly. So under the age of, of um, of 18 or over the age of 65. Uh, and so we could couple this with um, information on income. And, uh, you know, again, one of the interesting things about an urban area is we have some of these small and very small water systems. And the majority, in fact, of, of our small and very small water systems, which in rural areas would be very poor on average. In the urban area, we find some of them 
um, about half of them are not are not predominantly low income. Um, but what we can do in this kind of a framework is identify who is who is very low income versus moderate income and who isn't. And again, by overlapping some of these characteristics, begin to identify the most vulnerable and threatened systems uh, who have populations that are going to be most vulnerable to basically system failures of various types. Uh, you know, I, I, I showed you the young and the, the, the very young and the older, the elderly. If you, this is a map that characterizes the community water systems in terms of the traditional Cal and Viroscreen disadvantaged community classification. And you can see that there, that essentially that, that the, the, those gateway cities, uh, that necklace of, of cities there in the, sort of the, the southeastern part of the metropolitan area, um, over 50% uh, 50 of, of these populations would be classified as disadvantaged by the state criteria, uh, which means that in addition to having a uh, low income and they, they also bear a disproportionate uh, burden in terms of uh, pollution and other kinds of en environmental and health burdens. Uh, again, helping us understand who is vulnerable to some of these shocks as well. Um, and so, you know, one of, I'll just go ahead and wrap up uh, so that um, we, can, we can move on to the other presentation and then have a broader discussion of this. But some of the trends is that even in an urban county, um, many small and very small systems rely on groundwater. Um, that the, 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 it looks like in a place like LA, groundwater contamination, and I actually didn't show you the, if you go to the Water Atlas, which has all of the maps I've shown you, plus about twice as many, um, you can see that it's actually the middle, the middle sized community water systems that have the greatest um, incidence of contaminated groundwater. And again, I think that's the geographic patterns of development that they experienced in which they, they industrialized early and that industry contaminated their aquifers. Um, the other interesting thing that, um, that's happening in the LA County area, which I think is gonna be happening in many um, um, urban and rural counties, is that the disadvantaged community status and income status may diverge geographically. Um, because the disadvantaged community status includes other indicators beyond just income. And then uh, I think one of the greatest um, lessons here in terms of long-term health planning is that the climate change impacts are going to be very um, diverse across these systems. And that planning is something that we can and should do in order to mitigate those impacts. Um, and then I just want to come back to the fact that, you know, what, even though what we have on our radar screen as a result of this kind of analysis are the 228 community systems that are, um, that are known about and that we can carefully analyze, um, you know, the estimates I think, and I think Jennifer's going to talk about this, but there's several hundred thousand people that are in LA County that are off of community water systems. And we know very little about the threats and vulnerabilities that they face, except that they're relying on groundwater probably. Um, and then I just want to I just want to mention that the state is really trying to figure out uh, how to spend Prop One funding, uh, and and much of that funding is, is supposed to be targeting disadvantaged communities, but the state is struggling with how to define that um, for urban areas and urban counties. So I think with that I will uh, I'll hand it over. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, JR. And uh, we're going to um, go ahead and, and continue the, um, the presentation with our second panelist, and that's Jennifer Clary. So go ahead, Jennifer. Please, um, you may get started with your presentation. Thank you, Cheryl. And <laughs> thank, you, thank you, everyone, for inviting me to talk about something that I love to work on. I've been working on assistance to disadvantaged communities for about a dozen years on funding issues and other barriers and challenges. And I'm happy to tell you some of what I know and to get some feedback from you. So just to start on this, um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to, oh, there we go. There we go. I apologize, I forgot about the time delay on doing this. So just to divide this a little bit between rural and urban impacts, so in rural areas, you have 
um, water supply issues that are exacerbated by um, economic issues because agriculture is so water dependent that when you lose water supply for agriculture, you increase unemployment, um, you have impacts on, on economies, on access to food, in addition to access to water. Um, so just to kind of give you an example of, of the impacts of the drought in the Central Valley, I thought this is one of the better visuals I've seen. And it identifies the drop in groundwater levels. The Tulare Lake Basin is the bright red area in the lower right-hand corner. Um, and um, the, is, the redder it is, the deeper it is. So the dark red areas have had drops of over 60 feet in a 12-month period. The information I had is that the Tulare Lake Basin is overdrafting groundwater at the rate of about 3 million acre feet a year, which is more than the entire urban use in Southern California in annually. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I'm getting a little feedback on here, and I hope it's not difficult for you all to hear. Um, so when you look at loss of water supply, the state's been tracking wells that go dry um, since last year, and more than 2,000 wells have gone dry. And most of those are in Tulare County, which isn't surprising when you see the um, when you see the number, the, how how much the groundwater is dropped. I do want to point out, though, that LA County is number three in water loss and wells have lost their water supply with 150 wells since 2014. Um, so just to give you a little visual, if when you run out of water, you have to do whatever you can to get it. Run a hose from your next door neighbor. You go to the local, go to your neighbors or your relatives to pick up water in any with any um, with any containers that you have. So the state's actually been working really hard to help address some of these issues. Their, the state water board's cleanup and abatement fund has been used to provide emergency water supplies, bottled water, hauled water, water treatment for communities that have lost their water supply. The general fund, uh, the general, can you hear me? Oh, thank you. I'm getting a little less feedback now. The general fund um, provides dollars for um, some of the um, other impacts of the drought, which is local food banks, job training, housing assistance, and also help with paying water rates. In some of these areas, particularly in the Central Valley, um, water rates have increased because um, water systems have had to go out and seek other water supplies. And that water, and so the water rates become unaffordable for people who have also lost jobs because of the drought. So just moving on from there, um, one of the one of the communities that has been assisted moving on is East Porterville, and East Porterville I think is kind of the um, picture, the photo op of the drought. It's a community of about 300 homes on private wells, and more than half the wells have gone dry. The community has been on hauled water for more than a year. They're searching for long-term solutions haven't um, come to fruition yet. And I, that kind of just leads into my next topic of discussion, um, which is um, people who aren't served by a public water system like East Porterville. And so the, the Clean Water Act, when it was passed in 1974, created this line, this bright line um, between what is a water system, what's a public water system and what it isn't. And it's a system that serves 15 or more homes or 25 or more people um, year round. And that's a community water system. There's about 3,000 of them in California. Oh, there we go. So there's, so there's, there's below that. So it's important to know that the state regulates systems, the water systems um, recognized by the Clean Water Act, public water systems. If you're not a recognized public water system, the county, um, the county oversees you. So 
there are some some public water systems that counties oversee from 15 to 200 water from 15 to 200 connections, but every county oversees systems that are not a public water system. So those of you on the phone who are in the, the Environmental Health or Public Health Department, you this could be your area of responsibility. And one difficulty is we don't always know. We actually have to guess how many people aren't served by public water systems. And USGS has done a lot of um, estimates to try to figure it out using um, uh, using a fraction of the well logs, well drilling logs that are on file. And their estimate is that two and a half million Californians are not served by a public water system. And in LA County, that number is about 575,000. So that's a pretty significant population. People talk about it percentage-wise. I think half a million people is a big number wherever you are. Um, so this is just a good illustration from the Department of Water Resources of different areas of the state and um, how reliant they, and what their um, wells are being drilled for. And you can see that the dark blue at the bottom are domestic wells. And those domestic wells, you can see the Central Valley is where most of the wells are. But the South Coast is, has a pretty significant number of wells as well. Um, so urban impacts of drought. Um, whether you're on a private well or a public water system or higher water costs, um, inequitable investments in water conservation, a reduction in plant cover that reduces shade and increases local um, the sort of heat island effect, and you know a loss of local food sources. If you don't, if you can't afford the water or can't pay for the water, that has a cost. And so looking, so the first thing I'm going to look at is affordability. And affordability, of course, is a huge issue everywhere. And so one of our big problems about understanding affordability is that folks, is that um, agencies don't report affordability. So they don't report what water rates they're charging and who's paying what and what small and what disadvantaged households are paying for their water supply. They kind of, it's not something that data is collected on, so it's hard to understand how many people have unaffordable water rates. Then you have some things that have been done that make it more difficult to make water rates affordable. One is um, tiered rate structures have been recommended to encourage water conservation. It also helps for affordability. And the idea is as you use more water, you pay more um, for that water. So if you, if you have income problems, you, use, you try to stay in the lower rates. So you really get an extra boost from conservation. But a recent Supreme Court, state Supreme Court ruling in San Juan Capistrano kind of put a straitjacket on the use of tiered rate structures. And we're still trying to understand what impact that will have on water rates around the state. And that, rates, and that decision is based on Proposition 218, which I'm sure you're all familiar with that limits the ability to implement lifeline rates. They ba basically, it says that the rates charged to a consumer have to reflect the cost of service. And that means it's more difficult to carve out an opportunity to provide um, rate relief to the lowest income water users. The other difficulty is, is you have a large number of water systems, and they all self-fund their rates and conservation. And so they all have different rates. and some do lifeline rates despite Prop 218 and some don't. So it's very difficult to um, it, it, it's very difficult to really get a handle on what a standard rate would be. And then of course, if you have if you're trying to reduce water use and you're successful, um, that translates into higher rates. A 25% decrease in um, water use is going to mean a significant rate increase, and that's going to have a hardship for low-income communities. And just a, another interesting thing about LA is you have these really interesting, um, you have alternative water supplies, these water rias. Sorry, we have a hard time getting this to move forward. There we go. So you have, this is fairly unique. They have some in the San Jose area, but it's mostly Southern California. You have these water rias that, that uh, sell sort of, all kinds of water. It sells vended water, it sells ice, it sells water filtration devices, 
and they're regulated by the state rather than locals. But if you have a chance to go into one, it'd be good for you to just make sure that it's being run well and is clean because people are actually getting a lot of their drinking water from water rias and from alternative wa and from filtered water. So I saw a study many years ago that said 48% of the population of Los Angeles uses water filters. And of course, that's all well and good, but something else we found in some of the um, surveys we've done is that people very seldom change the filters when they filter water. Um, so to the extent that you're able to pass on some education advice, get people to change who use water filters to change their filters on a regular basis. So when it comes to water conservation, I think one difficulty is is that we might is that different people have different um, um, purposes in water conservation. And so if you're a water agency and you say, well, look, Beverly Hills is using 235 gallons per day, I want to focus on them because I can get more water savings from Beverly Hills. But in East LA, where they have the lowest, probably the lowest per capita use in Southern California, their median income is, you know, very low income. And, and that means that every gallon they use costs them extra money. So if we could focus more conservation on the communities that need it most, we get less gallon return, but we get more equity return. And that's difficult for some, for water agencies because that's not what they're being asked to do. Um, so, and again, most water conservation programs, the bulk of water conservation programs are based on a rebate formula, which is you buy a new washing machine, you buy a new toilet, we, we rebate part of the cost to you. And of course, Poor communities don't have that cash flow ability, so they're not able to um, work under that system. You also have renters who don't ha who often pay for increased water bills through their rent, but don't really have an option to save water and save money. And that's uh, something that is, I don't know of any just any water agency that's addressed that. And then the programs are developed and funded by individual agencies. So you can cross the street and have different access to water conservation programs. And so one recommendation that, I, a few recommendations I've ha I'd have for water conservation is to promote direct install programs. Like the Mothers of East LA um, in the 80s and 90s after the Mono Lake decision, who went door to door doing toilet installations. And that also is another recommendation is community-based conservation programs really help instill a conservation ethic and also provide jobs and funding. And so the state, the state, um, the Department of Water Resources is developing guidelines for water conservation, both for the cash, the lawn um, rebates that the governor's talking about, and more generally for 200 million in conservation funding in Proposition One. And I'm told it's supposed to be out this month, so you need to keep an eye out on the Department of Water Resources Conservation webpage for that. Another one I would recommend, this is something I'm really hoping we can uh, make happen this year, is Assembly Bill 401 by Assembly Member Dodd, which would basically task two state departments with developing um, a plan for a low-income water rate assistance program, just like energy users have and telephone users have and that water users don't. The legislature would have to adopt it, but this basically creates the framework to develop a program um, by 2017. It would be wonderful if this made it through, and those of you who could support it, I'd be thrilled to death. Thanks. So I'm almost done. I know I'm out of time. So then, and then the other quite, the other issue is Proposition 218 reform. The items I said, allowing lifeline rates, allowing tiered rate stru structures, allowing stormwater um, to be billed as a utility um, rather than a parcel tax. That's something that's moving forward, and you might want to get engaged in. And then monitoring. You guys have the responsibility to monitor state small systems and domestic wells, and having expanded oversight of those. For instance, requiring domestic wells, private wells, to do water quality testing when the property is sold would give you an, a, a, would help give us an understanding of the water quality of those people who are not served by a public water system. And then I just have one last push, which is 
don't create problems for the next generation. And I received this notice of preparation a couple weeks ago about a proposal to allow up to 40,000 parcels to be developed using hauled water as their water supply in Los Angeles. And I, I know that I'm fixated on safe drinking water, but I just think this is a really bad idea, and I would hope that you guys would weigh in on it as well. Thank you very much. I have a few Great. references Thank for you. Thank you. Jennifer, this is Katie Mommen. Uh, and we'll be posting these references as well as some other materials on our website. So I've just taken our panelists off mute and just wanted to take a moment here again to invite all of our participants to either send in questions um, using our question pane here or raise your hand um, to join uh, and ask a question that way. And I would also just like to prep everybody that we'll do a, a brief question and answer period for about five minutes. And then we're, we're going to be diving into a discussion about um, action and opportunities for local health departments to help mitigate some of the, the impacts of drought and all of these different dimensions, affordability, availability, quality, and other um, on disadvantaged communities. Uh, so please, again, feel free to send in your questions. And I'd just like to start with a question for you, JR. Um, that was some really wonderful data and mapping um, and I, I noticed you said that all of that information is publicly available. Could you just say a little bit about what it would take to get a picture like that in Los Angeles in other counties? I mean, is that coming from lots of different data sources? Is it readily available? How, how can other counties move forward to pull that kind of a picture together? It's a great question. And the most challenging part of all of that analysis is getting the, the boundaries of the water districts as accurate as you possibly can. And so almost every county has from either a state um, data source or its own local source um, some estimate of the shape files of each community system. Um, and so that's, and so the, every county will have a starting place for that. Um, the question is how accurate are those shape files? Um, and what we did in LA County is uh, we ended up taking three different data sources, none of which was super reliable by itself, and triangulating um, across the three. Um, and then having to do a little bit of outreach um, to specific water systems for, for which we couldn't resolve uncertainties by comparing three different, you know, supposed um, boundary maps. Um, so that's, the, that's step number one. Um, and then step number two is actually pretty easy if you have someone that's um, reasonably good at, at, at using data. Um, all of the background analysis there came either from the American Community Service Survey, which is the U.S. Census data source, which is available for every census tract in every county in the state, or it came from um, a tax assessor's a map, which every county also has which usually characterizes the, um, the parcels that have some tax burden within a county. And so there are really only three data sources. There's the, 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 mm. the existing shape files for the, the community water systems, there's the American Community Survey, and, then, and, that, and that really represents almost 90% of all of the, the analysis I showed you. And then there's some additional analysis that can be done by integrating the tax assessor's data from each county. Great. Thank you. Well, that's some wonderful work leading the way there. Um, Jennifer, a question for you. You talked uh, a bit about the extreme importance of reforming 218 and some efforts underway there. What do you think it's really going to take to build the, the political will or movement to set that in motion? Well, I think some of it has happened now. So we, we're continually getting these court decisions that, that restrict the ability of water agencies to shape their their rate structure. And I think the Capistrano decision mm -hmm. has generated a lot of interest in in expanding what we look at in Prop 218. There had been general agreement that we needed to reform the way stormwater is treated. Um, it's currently treated as sort of a issue that's uh, it's, a, it's assessed as a parcel tax instead of a utility, but it's regulated as utility, so we need to sort of fix that. So we also need to fix, we also need to have some kind of fix on the rate allowances. 
Mm, great. Okay. Um, well, one, th one other question, um, and if there are no other questions, this will be our last question before I move into a uh, discussion of opportunities. I was reading this morning about, uh, you know, emerging guidelines from the Department of Housing and Community Development around um, drought housing relocation assistance. Uh, and there's a call for input. Do either of you have um, anything to say about that? Are you involved in this work uh, to provide relocation and rental assistance for homes with dry wells? Uh, is that something that uh, you believe that local health departments should be getting involved in? Any comments on that? I am somewhat familiar with it. It's just starting now, and it's um, it's it's a difficult subject because when you're talking about housing relocation, a lot of these communities, people own their own homes and these are like long-standing communities. So um, I think that um, the trauma of moving is something that the health departments do need to be part of and do need to engage in. I would just add that, you know, Jennifer alluded to um, how we plan and support uh, development. And I think this is a critical question that we need to deal with both prospectively and, and not allow development in the areas that are going to place these homes in future um, precarious positions and vulnerabilities with respect to water supply and water quality. Um, but also for existing homes um, to give homeowners both you know, financial op options as well uh, in terms of connecting, but basically focusing on consolidation and expansion, um, you know, in, in especially in suburban areas. Um, and it's this is an area where I think we need a lot more policy um, thought going into how we create incentives for larger systems to support adjacent households that are on wells, as well as uh, smaller water systems that are underperforming. And we we really, as a state, you know, that's that's got to be a a, uh, a, a a big opportunity that we, it, it is a big opportunity and we, we just haven't put much effort into thinking about that, that transition because for, you know, just the fact that, that LA County has 228 water systems where, you know, your average water system enjoys enormous economies of scale. Um, so we can, we can meet the needs of, um, of, of homeowners much more cost effectively, much more reliably, and with much greater public safety if they're connected to uh, larger systems than if they're connected to small systems and certainly if they're on their own system. Great. Thank you. So now I just want to shift us a little bit here and really encourage our, our participants to chime in. It would be wonderful to hear from some of the different counties about what's happening or questions you have about actions that you would like to take um, and I'll just start us off here by asking our two panelists. Um, Jennifer, you had mentioned some, some act, you know, very concrete actions in terms of conservation and some of the, the State Water Board um, framing that's coming down now, uh, as well as getting involved in AB 401 and 218 and in monitoring. Um, I just love to ask you both again, maybe just some high level, you know, where do you feel like the, the biggest leverage points are for uh, local health departments? Um, Jared, did you want to add anything in on that? Well, I, I think that I would, I would actually start with a question, which is, you know, I really liked and applauded um, Jennifer's focus on financing low income assistance at the state level. Um, because I, I think that's a, um, a strategy that has worked for the electric utilities, for the for the investor-owned electrical utilities. But I also think that county-level public health needs a revenue source to begin to do a better job at understanding and managing these health risks for its residents that are related to water supply. And um, in general, if you look at air quality or you look at electricity or even climate change and transportation, all of those regulatory agencies have uh, a revenue system that supports their research and planning capacities and supports some um, income redistribution uh, system. We have nothing like that at water at either the state level or at the county level. And I think we all need to reflect a little bit on 
how to more effectively resource um, our capacity to identify and address some of these needs. Mm. That's a really good point. And do you think that there's opportunity uh, to advocate for for funds for these needs being included in uh, the Prop 1 funding or some of the other drought response programs that the state is providing? Well, I, I'd love to hear what Jennifer thinks, but I, I'm guessing that you're going to see a variety of legislative proposals that come to this conclusion that we, we need to look, we need to come up with better financing systems because the, this, the Department of Water Resource and the the state water quality control board simply don't have the information that they need um, in mm -hmm. some cases to even identify the size of the problem or to target some of these state level policies. Um, and so the, I think the need is, is, is becoming very obvious, but I don't know of a specific vehicle right now or strategy to that end. Well, in the, think, in the, in the budget that was just passed, um, the State Water Board asked for and received permission to change the way they assess fees to run the drinking water program, which before had depended very heavily on federal funds, which are not um, guaranteed to continue, and um, charged large water, water agencies by the hour. So in order to get any funding for the program, they had to put in a certain amount of time with these large water agencies simply for dollars even though most of the, their time needs to be spent with smaller agencies. It's also the reason why a lot of counties have declined to um, be the regulator for some of the small water systems because there just isn't money to handle it. So I think the State Water Board is starting to take the first steps in doing this. So they're changing their fee structure, they're using their cleanup and abatement account, which is a penalty account, they're using that to help address some immediate problems. I think the county level really is important because I think the difficulty, and I'm sorry, I think your audience is better able to talk about this than I am, but there's so many competing needs at these public health departments and so many of them are critically underfunded that water often gets, um, you know, it's at the end of the line because there isn't enough money to do it and because um, there are just too many other life and death decisions they have to make on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to put a, a bookmark in it there. I wish we had another hour to keep the discussion going. But just wanted to let our, our audience know that we will be consolidating um, some of the opportunities that both of our speakers shared during their presentations, as well as these ones that have come up during this uh, discussion period. Um, and I would love to just thank our two speakers and hand the control back over to Cheryl Barrett to, to just wrap us up here in the last couple of minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much, JR and Jennifer. Um, I was uh, taking a lot of great notes and questions for my own team and my own health department, and I think we have uh, some cool key, a good key lessons uh, learn and additional points for discussion for our alliance. So we're, we're going to be moving forward with some of the tidbits of information and inspiration that you have given us to, to really position ourselves in public health to be able to address um, water uh, the right way and, and, and speak to the impact that we will see in, in public health and, and act on it. And uh, thank you, thank you so much, and also for our participants today. And I just want to take a couple of seconds to remind um, everyone on the webinar today about our leadership series, our upcoming webinars. All of that information is on the Alliance website. And these are really conversations to provide us some tools and resources to support um, whatever action that we need to take to address these issues. We encourage you to spread the word in terms of um, participation in those webinars. We are also conducting a webinar series on um, additional series on water and health, and a lot of those information will be on our website with a special focus on environmental health, leadership with regulatory focus, and one also on nutrition focus. So that's a, a very exciting um, upcoming topic that we'll be um, participating on. And um, another thing that I would also just uh, encourage folks is just to keep thinking about these issues that we are um, learning more about and, and thinking about what are the um, finer points and ex, um, extra um, strategic way that we can use data to help inform 
our local officials as well as um, actors at the at the regional and state level. But thank you so much, and uh, um, I'm going to go ahead and also thank um, Katie and and um, and all of the Public Health um, Alliance staff for putting together our series today. And we hope to see you at the future webinars.